the final uh, lecture on sort of finite volume schemes, wave propagation schemes that are uh, behind uh, GeoClaw. And so today what I'll talk about is this well-balancing issue, uh, how we extend the, the um, <coughs> algorithms to higher dimensions, and I'll say a few things about adaptive mesh refinement, okay, because that's really sort of the, the computational uh, efficiency that, that is, is um, taken advantage of in GeoClaw. So the plan uh, will be to, so yesterday, those were sort of the things I covered yesterday. Um, <laughs> I said a few things about how Riemann solvers actually make it into a code, in ClawPack in particular. Um, I said some things about approximate Riemann solvers, and uh, ClawPack and GeoClaw use essentially a row solver. I think GeoClaw has, has sort of modified that approach a bit, but, but essentially it's an approximate Riemann solver. And, and I said a few things about accuracy, sort of high resolution methods based on uh, using uh, wave limiters. So today I'll cover well balancing, higher dimensions, and, and adaptive mesh refinement. Okay, so uh, well balancing. So the shallow water wave equations, again, this is the 1D version. Um, with bathymetry, well, the bathymetry ter term will typically show up there on the, on the right-hand side as a source term. And so a naive approach, and, and I don't want to say this, you know, it's not, it's not that it's a naive approach, it's um, because this is often what's done. When you have a source term like this, what you will do is you have some sort of algorithm that treats the left-hand side terms, and in this case might be something like the wave propagation algorithm, a finite volume scheme, a finite element scheme, something like that, and you take a, a time step of that scheme, and then you follow it by some kind of step on your, on your um, source term. And you know, sometimes that source term, for example, might be a diffusion term or some other kind of nonlinear term. In this case, it happens to be bathymetry. So the first thing you might try is this kind of operator splitting approach. Unfortunately, in uh, the tsunami modeling case, because of the, the, the sort of the, the physical the, um, uh, dimensions of the physical problem, this approach doesn't work very well at all. And I think David George showed some examples of, of um, how oscillations can develop because basically the, numer the truncation error in the numerical methods um, that are used to do the two different pieces of the updating, the left-hand side and the right-hand side, don't cancel nicely. And so while the scheme might still be convergent in the limit, in the sort of the on the mesh sizes that are practical and of interest in an actual tsunami <coughs> modeling case, what you'll see is oscillations that are on the order of the size of the phenomena you're actually trying to look at. So how do we treat this? So uh, remember yesterday I talked about a row solver, and a row solver requires that we find some state q hat between a qi and a qi minus one, so our, our values in neighboring grid cells such that we satisfy this type of expression. And, you know, we introduced that idea. It was kind of the ranking Hugonio jump condition um, in the uh, nonlinear case. And in the linear constant coefficient case, this, was the, this is how the expression looked. And you had to be careful about how you chose this Q hat. And I said something about row average values, these kind of special values involving kind of weighted things weighted in terms of square roots. And this is required, otherwise you don't get conservation. Um, but, you know, it, to actually find those row average values may not always be possible. For some complicated, for, for shallow water, they do exist, but for other systems, they may not always exist. And so it's possible then to just simply say, you know what, I'm not going to worry about, about matrix A so much. I'm just simply going to decompose the jump in the flux into a, sort of do an eigenvector decomposition of the flux jump itself, just kind of a, where those, those eigenvectors are, in fact, eigenvectors of our flux Jacobian, but where we haven't really evaluated the flux Jacobian, strictly speaking, at a row values, but at some other values, maybe the average value uh, between the left and the right states, something like that. So if you do that, you get these what are called, what we've called Z waves, okay? 
This, and this approach is sort of called an F-wave approach because, in fact, you're decomposing the flux rather than decomposing the jump in the values themselves. All right, so that's just kind of this general approach that, that has proven to be useful in situations where row solvers are, are not, row averages are not available. So one way to extend this to the, to the use of source terms is to simply include when you're doing this flux, since the, the, flux, the difference in fluxes is what should balance the, uh, in, this, in the shallow water case, the bathymetry term. That, those are the two things we want to balance, okay, and in steady state. So what we'll do now is split into eigenvectors, split the flux difference minus the source term, okay? And now you think about this. If we do this, suppose, suppose we are in a steady state where exactly the flux difference is exactly balanced by the source term. In that case, we won't generate any waves. Our betas, the beta coefficients of our eigenvectors in this case, will all be exactly zero. And our update will, uh, we will we'll have exactly zero update to our solution. Okay? So this is going to allow us to maintain steady states exactly. Um, how this sort of makes it into, into something like claw pack, uh, the fluctuations then become directly defined in terms of these Z waves. <laughs> So in a, in a way that's analogous to, to what I described yesterday, our update formula looks exactly like this, plus second order correction terms. And now, though, if we happen to be in a situation where we are in steady state, that A plus and A minus will be exactly zero, and our update formula won't do anything. We'll maintain the steady state exactly. Okay? And so that turns out to, be, to have been critical in, in, in sort of making making GeoClaw work. So if you were to actually sort of go into GeoClaw and, and look at what, at, at how the source term, how the bathymetry term is treated, you might, um, uh, you know, GeoClaw involves obviously Riemann solvers, but also a source term. There's a sort of a, 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 a Fortran file called src2.f, which you can, you can dig around the GeoClaw library. And you might look at that source term file, and what you'll see is that the bathymetry is not included in there at all. Okay, so you won't see any sign of the bathymetry. The only things that are treated in the source term are friction coefficients and co Coriolis terms. To see where the, the bathymetry is treated, you actually need to go into the normal Riemann solver. Okay, so that's how that's how that's handled in, in GeoClaw. Um, yeah. I think that's all I'm going to say on that. Um, so now we want to extend the wave propagation algorithm to higher dimensions. Okay. So our aim is to extend the one-dimensional wave propagation to uh, logically Cartesian meshes. And at this point, I feel like I should say something about why we sort of religiously, you know, stick to Cartesian meshes because you've seen lots of examples. In fact, I think most of the examples we've seen here have been on these really impressive triangular meshes that that do such a nice job of of, um, of uh, modeling uh, ocean shore topography, coastal topography, things like that. Well, part of the reason is that, you know, it's kind of a, a, a numerical reason. The solutions are not dependent on the quality of the mesh. So if you have a Cartesian mesh, your, your cells are all quads and they are typically going to be a sort of, you know, nicely behaved. The algorithms are easier to to construct on smooth, logically Cartesian meshes. And typically, the results will be more accurate than on unstructured, non-smooth meshes. Um, there's probably some debate there, because obviously, if you're using a higher order DG method, you're going to get very accurate methods on, on unstructured meshes. Um, you know, another reason is that the layout of the Cartesian data maps directly to computer memory layout. Um, Potentially improving runtime performance. So see, these are some of the ideas, some of the reasons that we've that we've stuck to Cartesian meshes. Um, uh, so 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 now let's think about how we extend our our wave propagation algorithm to, to higher dimensions. Well, so the first thing we have to think about: what does it even mean for an equation to be hyperbolic in two dimensions? Remember, I said in the one D case, I said that A had to have real eigenvectors, had to have um, real real eigenvector values and a complete set of eigenvectors. Well, in higher dimensions, we have that same requirement, but now that same requirement must hold 
for all possible orientations of, uh, of so in, in sort of any direction. This, this matrix NX, sort of we have to, if we take our matrix A and dot it with N, okay, that, that, um, that matrix must be diagonalizable. So, so I guess what I mean is, is uh, this linear combination of A and B must be diagonalizable with real eigenvalues. And you might think this, this, this how are we ever going to verify this for real, for, for sort of complicated systems. But it turns out that uh, for many hyperbolic problems of interest, these equations are isotropic or rotationally invariant. So that means that the solution to the Riemann problem will have the same structure in any, in any direction. So that um, we can reuse our one-dimensional Riemann solvers in higher dimensions. We just simply have to reorient our data and we treat the, the solution in kind of the same 1D sense. Okay, so this is going to allow us to kind of reuse all the machinery that we had for, for 1D. So the basic strategy in going to sort of higher dimensions, again, we're on a Cartesian mesh. So, so that's going to simplify a number of things. So we're going to solve 1D Riemann problems in an X direction. So we're going to sweep along our grid in X. Then we're going to repeat, follow that with a sweep in, in Y. And then we're going to update the solution, either after each sweep or after both sweeps are done. Okay? And so the question is, you know, how do we coordinate these two things? So now in 2D, we have, we have left and right data, not only in X, but also in Y. So we'll sweep in X, sweep in Y, and then somehow combine the results of these two, of these two um, operations. So the first sort of obvious thing to try is what's called a donor cell upwind method. And in this case, we simply apply a 1D Riemann problem in the X direction. We apply a 1D Riemann problem in the Y direction. And um, we add the results together. Okay, so the updates are done only after both sweeps have been performed. Uh, and, and this leads to sort of, a, sort of a, a picture like this, okay? We have waves. We might first have a wave, that, 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 that red wave that goes from left to right. We might have a blue wave that goes from the bottom to the top. And the update in the cell is going to be the result of those two, those two waves entering the cell, okay? So this is kind of the most, the, the sort of the, the first thing you might think to try. Um, it's got, it's going to be stability CFL limited. So the CFL limit is actually now going to be the sum, rather than rather than requiring that either uh, u delta t over x or b delta t over y be less than <coughs> equal to one. The actual sum has to be less less than one. So that in practice, for a diagonal flow, we actually would have a CFL less than, less than 1. So square, 1 over square root 2, for example. Um, so now what's the accuracy of this method? Well, um, the problem, even if we've included second order correction terms in each of the sweeps, those kind of linear, additional linear terms that I talked about yesterday, we still are not going to get this cross derivative term that we actually need to show that the truncation error of the scheme is fully second order. So in fact, the result of the, the, is that this method is only first order, even though we've used second order 1D solves. Okay? So then you might think, so the next thing to try is say, well, all right, so instead of updating after both sweeps are done, why don't I sweep first in X, update my solution, so get a Q star there, okay? And then I'll sweep in Y using that updated solution. Mm -hmm. And it turns out this is exactly the right thing to do to, to get higher order. So um, uh, second order corrections are, if we include second order correction, uh, second order corrections, this dimensional split algorithm is second order. Um, there's no need to explicitly include cross derivative terms since they're treated automatically in this two stage process. Okay, so we've simply, by just applying normal Riemann solves, first in X, then in Y, and by simply using the kind of updated information in the Y direction, um, we're able to actually get, improve the order of accuracy from first order to second order. Uh, again, it uses only the 1D normal Riemann solves. And the only slight drawback, and, and it's arguable whether this is a drawback, is that it's not always practical 
in, in to implement this kind of dimensionally split algorithm. The first disadvantage is that there's going to be a slight bias, right? If I do first x, then y, you sort of feel like, well, you know, why, why should maybe, what, maybe I would have gotten a different answer if I had done first y and then x. And so there's a little bit of symmetry, sort of a lack of symmetry there that may be a little bit annoying. Um, but the other thing is that it becomes especially difficult in sort of adaptive mesh settings where you want to have a, a multi-rate scheme, okay? It becomes difficult to sort of coordinate the information. So, so then a kind of the final thing to think about is sort of what's called a, a corner transport upwind method. And in this case, what we're going to do is sort of trace back in the fully two-dimensional direction to kind of see where our solution came from. Um, and in the in, in sort of the wave propagation approach, we think of of waves as kind of going from as as sort of not only going across this across the um, kind of the, the normal edge, but also sort of into the cell above that little <coughs> triangular piece there in in kind of one step. And that way, information can actually propagate in one step all the way from, say, the lower corner cell to the upper cell. And it makes for a slightly more complicated looking, looking update. So whereas before, the update only involved the things on that first line are this, this sort of correction, these kind of corner transport terms now come in. And in particular, what you see explicitly are u times v. And those you can think of as being the cross derivative terms that are needed to, to make the truncation error work out. The scheme that I've written here is still only going to be first order because I don't have any linear terms, but at the very least, what I now have is, is something that has fully, fully couples the multidimensional nature of the problem. Um, again, this is just kind of the, 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 the way that this is implemented in Clawpack is that we, we have these, these sort of correction terms that were, you, were used to update to get second order corrections, but are now also <laughs> going to be used to construct fluxes. So you think of that little triangular piece, that green piece, that came from the left cell into the right cell. We can formulate a flux based on the transport of that sort of area into the cell. The flux looks like has exactly that form. And then the scheme itself actually will involve what those additional fluxes to get that corner trans to get those those sort of corner terms. And this is the full sort of second order wave propagation algorithm. Okay? So it's really a corner transport up, uh, update with second order corrections. And, and this is what we refer to as the, the unsplit algorithm. Okay? So if we include limiters, we have a high resolution method. It has better stability properties properties than just a two-dimensional version of Lax Wendroff since the cross-derivative terms are taken in the upwind direction rather than averaged, okay? It's got a stability constraint that's now going to be better than the donor cell method, so this is really the sort of the optimal stability constraint. And it extends naturally to variable coefficient problems, okay? Um, in in, in CLAWPAC, this is now implemented, and now we have two Riemann solvers. We have a normal solve and a transverse solve. So again, if you were to get curious and look at the code, you would see now two Riemann solvers in the, in the 2D case. And in a typical sort of claw pack or, ge or geo claw run, what you'll find in your kind of this, this Python script are now two additional parameters that control the order in higher dimensions. There's first of all the order of the scheme. So again, this is whether we include those linear correction terms that were, that were, uh, that I described yesterday. And now we have this additional term, do we want to do transverse Riemann solves? And that's this transport of these sort of triangular pieces. And then there's basically four different modes that the scheme can run in. A donor cell upwind mode with a CFL limit is a uh, method, is, is sort of set the order to one and don't do any transverse solves. A corner transport upwind method is uh, set the order to one and um, do the trans and, and have a, a, the transverse solve also only first only sort of a transverse solve of only the first order terms. Uh, the full wave propagation is going to be both set to two and a dimensionally split algorithm is set the order to two and then set it on a, put a minus sign there on the on the transverse solve and and that just sort of tells it to to the to do the the update 
in this slightly different way. Okay, so we got basically four ways that 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 claw pack is run, and I think I think the geo claw typically uses this two two value. Okay. All right, so now that's that's how more or less how we extend it to higher dimensions. Now I want to say something about adaptive mesh refinement because to really make all of this um, all of this stuff efficient on a cart, if we're going to insist on a Cartesian grid, you know what we really have to think about then is is how to how to make this efficient, okay? Because we obviously can't <laughs> refine the grid everywhere simply to uh, this is just kind of a, an exaggerated example simply to resolve say the interface on that on that um, uh, it's kind of an odd shape maybe for this conference but this is a, an example of a flow by mean curvature so what this thing is doing is is shrinking down to a center and it's a nice shrinking down to a dot that eventually disappears and it's a nice example of, of for using AMR because it demonstrates you know you get nice nice kind of uh, yeah so anyway so so right so so Maybe the next slide explains a little better here. So there are lots of problems in which we're only interested in sort of, there's a, there's a clear separation of scales, and we're only interested in, say, a solution in a tiny portion of the, of the domain, and yet um, uh, we, we, we want to include these larger domains because the features that we're interested in will sort of follow, the, sort of can be followed throughout the domain. So two obvious examples. You've seen lots of examples of tsunami modeling, with um, and so I think David George showed really nice examples there. And here's another example of, of a flame that was done uh, at the at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And then there are other places in which this kind of idea of using adaptive mesh refinement is is going to be useful. Um, so there's different approaches to doing AMR. There's kind of the block structured AMR, which is what I'm going to talk about next. There's, there's, oh, but there are a few other ideas. A tree-based adaptivity, the idea, and here's a picture of that. The idea is that you have a sort of a coarse grid, and whenever you decide that you need to refine, you simply just chop the cell into four pieces, and, and, and you keep doing that until the feature that you're interested in is sitting only on sort of really small cells, okay? So this might be an example of tree-based refinement. And then in the finite element world, they actually have, or I, I would have to say maybe unstructured grid world, there would be lots of possibilities because there you, you, can, not only, you can vary your, you can have sort of a multi-resolution, variable resolution where you allow your triangles, I think Cheryl talked about this yesterday, to sort of vary in size from the coast to out, out in the Atlantic Ocean. And you can do this, I guess there's various, you know, H refinement, P refinement, with and without hanging nodes. There's lots of flavors of adaptivity in, in, the, in the unstructured world. Um, but we're going to talk about block structured AMR. And the idea there is that we have a Cartesian grid. We have some feature we're interested in. And what we do is we lay down patches of refinement around the area that we're interested in. Okay. So these methods were designed to improve shot, were designed to improve shot capturing methods. All right. What you see here is a coarse grid in the background, a next grid that's I think a, a resolution that's twice as fine, and then these patches that just look like rectangles without any grid lines on them at all. Those would be patches that are at some, the, the, where the if I if I plotted the grid lines, it would be too coarse and you or too too dark and you wouldn't see anything. So those are grids that are actually at four times the resolution of that, of that coarser grid, okay? And lots of people have sort of used these methods and, and worked on developing them. So here's kind of the hierarchy. This, this is the picture you want to have in mind when thinking about GeoClaw, because what GeoClaw is is a coarse grid with finer grids layer on top, okay? So at some point... And I'll say how we actually solve on this, but, but this is kind of the way you want to think about the grid hierarchy. Okay? So the data is stored in this sort of layered, nested hierarchy of logically Cartesian grids. Uh, Multi-rate time stepping is based on mesh size. So by having these layers of Cartesian grids, we can actually take a larger CFL number on the coarse grid and a smaller time step on the finer grids. 
The grids are dynamically or adaptively refined and de-refined, so these things are allowed to move. That's a key feature. You know, when, when, uh, often when people talk about mesh refinement, <coughs> they don't necessarily mean that the meshes are being remeshed at every time step to follow, to kind of follow the, the solutions. Um, and the communication is done via a layer of ghost cells. So every patch, every sort of logically rectangular grid will have a layer of ghost cells that it uses to communicate with other grids. Um, so the key advantage here is that every single patch is a rectangle and for at the very least for uh, explicit single step algorithms, which, which Clawpack is, it becomes then all we need to worry about is how to solve on this single patch. Okay, and so it makes it easy to construct algorithms to sort of put these patches together. So we have some requirements, you know, fine grid boundaries, and they're sort of obvious. Fine grid boundaries are always aligned with the coarse grid coordinate lines. Finer meshes are properly nested into coarser meshes. That means we can't have sort of weird arrangements where we might have um, a fine grid sort of three meshes where the, the, the coarse mesh and the finest mesh somehow overlap without any intermediate mesh in between. Okay, so, so this just means that um, we know that meshes will always only communicate with a mesh that's sort of one finer or one coarser. Um, we assume that we're going to use the same discretization scheme at all levels. Now, you might think that, you know, looking at this kind of adaptive hierarchy, you might think, ooh, this would be a perfect opportunity to do different physics on different levels, okay? Do some kind of really coarse global physics on the coarse grid and do, you know, really detailed physics on the finer level. That might be a really nice idea. I don't know anybody who really does it that way because I think it becomes very difficult to know how to coordinate the solutions. So we really assume that the algorithm that we have scales at all resolutions. And this becomes a problem, of course, for algorithms that rely heavily on parameterizations, uh, physics parameterizations. But, but we don't tend to, to, to worry too much about that, so we assume that the, the equations look the same at every, at, at, at every level. Uh, ghost cell values are obtained from the coarse grid or neighboring fine grids. Um, uh, let's see. And averaging, to communicate between grid solutions, we use averaging and interpolation. And I'll say a bit more about that when I talk about the actual algorithm. So, uh, again, more requirements. Well, we like the single grid layout should be used whenever possible, okay? Um, we, we want to avoid, and, and so the idea is that we really want to avoid complicated stencils at the corresponding interfaces. And again, this is done because we, we sort of communicate through ghost cells. Um, the solution on our grid hierarchy should have the same order of accuracy as on the single grid algorithm. Okay, so we should, whatever we do on this hierarchy, should, the solution should be better than what it is on the, on the, on the uh, single grid. Okay, so this should be an improvement. And, and it's not always taken for granted, depending on how these things are implemented, that that will be the case. But that is certainly our, always our goal. Conservation should be maintained. So if the PDE is in cons conservative form, we don't want to lose mass by, again, going to this hierarchy. And, the, and, and sort of the overhead in managing this grid hierarchy should not impact our performance in it, you know, it, it significantly, if, if at all. Okay? So, so in fact, it should be a win. We should, we should win by going this, not, not sort of kill ourselves with overhead. Okay? So how do, how do we go about solving on this thing? So uh, multi-rate time-stepping algorithms. So the idea now is that we've got a coarse grid on which we're going to allow ourselves to take a large time step, and we have finer grids on which, we're gonna, we, which we want to take fine grid steps. So how's this going to work? So we're going to advance the coarsest level by delta t. We're going to interpolate coarse grid solution to the fine grid ghost cells. We're going to advance the fine grid r time steps by a time step delta t over r. So think of r as 2, maybe. We're going to average the solution from fine grids to coarse grid. And then we're going to adjust the coarse grid solution to ensure flux continuity at the coarse fine boundaries. And then we're going to tag cells for refinement and regrid. And I'm going to say very little about, I mean, I'll say next to nothing about how we decide where we refine. Because that, that's, that's a key aspect of this. You know, if we, 
we don't have good refinement criteria, then it may not make sense to do any of this. But we're going to assume that we do have some kind of decent refinement criteria. And how we do the regridding, you know, there's a, you, you might ask, well, how do you even decide where these boxes go? If I arbitrarily tag a bunch of cells, it's not obvious how to construct <laughs> these boxes. And the, um, the algorithm was the sort of the, the burger Augustos algorithm. Okay? This, is, this, is a, this is essentially it. Okay, and, and I guess what I have next here is kind of a, 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 a movie. Whoops, it started already. Okay, well, of how this is going to go. And I actually, I want to I want, uh, stop it here. Okay, I'm going to stop it because I want to show you. Uh, oh, now I'm going to have this problem I had yesterday. Oh, no, it did it. Okay. No. All right, so what this is. I've got four levels here of, of refinement. Okay, I've got a coarse grid and then three finer levels. And what I'm showing you here is kind of a, a time step, say, delta t, t and t plus delta t at the very top. So the coarse grid is able to take a time step of size delta t. The next level is it has to take two time steps of size delta t. The next level will have to take four time steps of delta t over t, uh, four. And the last time step will have to take eight, eight time steps of delta t over eight. Okay? And the red dot indicates uh, exchange, boundary condition exchange between a level and its coarser level. So the fine grid, in order to do an update, will have to get ghost cell data from a coarser level. Okay? So the, in the animation, what you'll see is this kind of recursive procedure that carries this out. You'll see kind of a fine grid step. And then you'll see the fine grid try to take another step, but it won't be able to because it won't have boundary condition data from the coarse grid. So it will stay yellow because it's sort of a pending operation. And then what will happen is the coarse grid, coarser grid will then take a step. The, fine, the, date, the, the, the boundary condition data will be interpolated in kind of a time interpolated way. Um, to that finer grid, and then the fine grid can take can take a step. So I'll just show you how this kind of works algorithmically. Now let's see here, is it going to work? Okay, so there we have our our uh, three levels, and the fine we take we start on the fine grid, and we fill in ghost cell data as we need it. And then, we're, and then we're done. So this is kind of this, this sort of multi-rate adaptive algorithm that, that we use. And this is sort of behind the, working behind the scenes in GeoClaw. So you might ask what exactly, you know, what kind of performance can we expect from something like this? And I, I sort of worked out this, uh, this, it's a bit complicated here, but I just want to point out one thing. So imagine we had a fine grid at the finest level of refinement and we would like to then use adaptive mesh to get the same effective resolution, but only in a smaller portion of the grid. And what this essentially says is that is the following. If you have a, a domain and your fine, the grids at the finest level occupy, say, 10% of your domain, what's the most speed up you can expect? The maximum speed up you can expect is a factor of 10. Okay? There's no way to beat that. And depending on how much of the grid you're refining, you may do worse than that. Okay? So in a typical geoclaw situ simulation, if your the the finest region of your domain occupies, say, uh, you know, one percent of your entire domain, then you can expect a speed up of a hundred. Okay, basically. Okay, conservation. Now I'm going to say a few things about how we maintain conservation at the, at the coarse fine boundaries. Um, so again, I had this slide yesterday. Conservation is simply this property that, that uh, the amount of stuff we have in our, in this case, uh, mass and momentum, shouldn't change from one time step to the next unless we have fluxes of mass or momentum at the boundaries. So in an AMR setting, this is accomplished in the following way. So, so what do we do? We have a coarse grid and a fine grid. The coarse grid, um, does this 
push that in. Oh, okay. Not take, oh, yeah. oh, there we go. So here's our fine grid. Here's our coarse grid. We take a step of delta. You can, and, and, or this, this is a ghost cell on the fine grid. And to get that value, we interpolated, say, from these three coarse grid values. We put a ghost cell here. And then we use, and then we go to do our update. So on the coarse grid, our update in this cell right, this cell right here, for example, might look involve a flux at this edge and a flux at this edge. So here's the flux at this edge right here, and here's the flux at this edge right here. The update on the fine grid, so the update in this cell right here is going to involve this flux and this flux. Okay? Now, so what we've done now is update the solution using two different fluxes at this edge right here. And that's going to kill our conservation, all right, because we really need these fluxes to match up. Because really what we would like is this cell here should have really been updated with this flux. But since we want to do this kind of multi-rate time stepping, that won't necessarily have happened. But what we can do, and so as a result, our solution rather than being smooth as we go from the coarse grid to the fine grid, we'll have some sort of kink in here because our fluxes, because of this discontinuity in the fluxes. And so what we want to do is fix that. And this is a little bit, uh, maybe I went a little overboard on this diagram here, but these, these uh, ellipses are, are kind of, think of these as the fluxes that have been used to update a particular solution. So for example, uh, this yellow dot here has been updated with these two fluxes. And the fluxes, if, since we're doing this sort of in a multi-level way, we update, our fluxes are being updated. Kind of, we have to accumulate fluxes. In any case, what we really want, this cell here should have been updated with a fine grid flux and a coarse grid flux. So we can modify the original update by simply adding in the difference of those fluxes. Okay, So the difference between the flux that was used here and the flux used here and um, that gets us exactly the right, sort of gets us exactly the right update. The end effect is that we have a correction term. At the end of a, of a particular update, the coarse grid gets corrected with, a, flu with a, 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 a correction term that involves the difference of fluxes used on the coarse and fine grids. And that will sort of fix this problem and allow us to sort of make our, our solution continuous at the boundary and reduce the number of artifacts that you might see between coarse and fine grids. Okay, so again, in claw in GeoClaw, what are sort of parameters that control AMR? Well, things like the maximum number of grids that you might want to use, the refinement factors. Okay, um, uh, a, a taller this this is a this is in fact not you. This is simply saying don't use this feature. There's a there's sort of a fancier error estimation, which uh, GeoClaw typically doesn't use. Uh, how often do we regrid? How often do we, how, how closely do we want to track the solution? Okay, and this says every three time steps is how often I want to regrid. And if you worry that regrid is, is expensive, you might not want to do this so often. And then finally, um, what kind of buffer cell should we have? You know, you imagine you're on a fine grid, your solution's kind of marching along on the fine grid, you don't want it to fall off the fine grid, okay? You want it to stay there. And this is what controls how many extra buffer cells should you include so your fine grid doesn't fall off the fine grid and end up on the coarse grid. And, and these two things should probably be somewhat coordinated because if you're only gonna regrid every three steps, you need to have enough buffer cells to make sure that you don't lose your solution between uh, sort of regridding intervals. If you're interested in how GeoClaw actually tags cells for refinement, you can look in this file here and it will show you it bases it essentially on sea surface height. But then there are other criteria, user sort of user defined ways to specify a refinement. <coughs> um, I think that's all I'm going to say about GeoClaw, so I thought I would take the last few minutes to say a few things about uh, sort of AMR mesh refinement software in general. And I guess I thought it might be interesting. I know people have sort of talked about doing mesh refinement in various ways. And I'm not necessarily advocating sort of these sorts of approaches for this community, although, although I'll mention that um, AMR CLAW is, is the basis for, for GeoClaw. So here, that was an example of 
sort of an existing general purpose software for doing adaptive mesh refinement that existed and that was then turned into a sort of a domain specific application. In some sense it's easier to go that route rather than take an existing code in a, in a sort of a domain app, in, a, in an application area and then try to add AMR afterwards. It turns out that that's, that can be quite challenging. Um, these four, I mentioned these six here, and I actually have a web page that kind of describes these in a little more detail. I mentioned these five because they're all large frameworks. They've been sort of developed by a community, often at DOE labs. Um, C and C++, Fortran libraries, they don't really have anything in the way of GUIs. They often started life as research codes, and they're being used to solve some serious sort of sort of uh, large-scale applications in astrophysics and nuclear fusion and in various geophysical related related uh, fields, okay? And I, I guess I'm not going to say too much more about these codes, but what I do want to say is just a few things about sort of an approach that we're now looking at that may be of interest. Um, we've been kind of looking at block-structured AMR on quad and op trees. And so as, as kind of a new approach to doing adaptive mesh refinement, so we, we've, we're, we're working with this highly scalable parallel quad tree op tree library called PForest, which was developed by uh, Karsten Verstedi, the, the person I'm collaborating with, to do grid management. So when you think about AMR, you think there's sort of two distinct pieces. There's this grid management piece, and then there are the numerics. And, and the codes that I showed you before often don't just separate those two. Everything is kind of built into one code. And what we're doing here is, gonna, is trying to demonstrate that it's in, in fact uh, possible and, and perhaps desirable to separate out the tasks of grid management from numerics. And of course, and we can do, and then, and then of course, you know, hopefully we'll gain scalability and, 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 um, and, and performance. So uh, using a tree-based grid layout, the, 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 the AMR that I described, and, and GeoClaw in particular, is not really a tree-based grid layout. But it makes communication and grids much simpler. And if you haven't tried to implement it, it may be hard to see in which the sense in which this is true, but, but it's definitely true. Uh, refinement becomes trivially. And, and I guess the main idea is that there's this clear separation between grid management and numerics. So uh, PForest is just a, a sort of a code, a large scale tree based code that is designed to scale to this, this large, high number of elements. Um, one of the features, so here when I say tree-based, this is what the uh, sort of the AMR adaptive, adaptive uh, uh, tree looks like. It's, you, you can actually order all these patches, and I haven't said yet what, what we're going to do with these patches, but I'll say that in a minute. You can order the leaves in the tree in a very particular way, and that, that gives you sort of achieves uh, data locality um, and scalability. Okay, so neighbors... So, so grid patches that are that neighbor in space are likely to be put on the same processor, and that's that's going to turn out to be key in making this uh, high performance. This is just an example of how P Forest was used in, in kind of a uh, Antarctic ice sheet modeling exercise. I know. Okay, so here's the deal. So P Forest is a tree-based code, and what you have to imagine is that in every every single one of these cells is that Cartesian tree-based structure. And so tree base is a, so, so P forest is a multi-block code. So each block is a tree. That's where the forest part comes from. So what we see is the All you see are the blocks. Yeah, you're not looking at the trees. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll say something about this. So what we're doing is we're taking, now here's a single block, okay? So this is what one of those blocks might look like. Um, what we're doing is using this structure to, and we're going to put meshes inside of each of these, inside of each of these leaves. So here's a 16 by 16 grid. Inside of here, and I haven't shown the grid lines, this will be a 16 by 16 grid. This will be a 16 by 16 grid. This will be a 16 by 16 grid. So this is how we're going to use sort of the block structured AMR algorithm in essentially unchanged, but in this kind of new setting. So a zoom might look something like this. Here's a coarser grid. Here's a finer grid. And what you notice is that this is very much more structured than in the original kind of uh, block structured approach. So now the hierarchy, we think of grids as existing on, on levels, but now we notice we don't have any overlapping grids. There's no big coarse grid underneath. Okay? So um, this is maybe, maybe, it's a little hard to see. This is sort of 
it's supposed to be a kind of, yeah. So these, you imagine these, these grids are all at different levels. Here's the finest level, and here are the, the sort of the coarser levels. And, and so whereas in the, the sort of original AMR approach, you saw a big coarse grid here and, and finer grids that were sitting on top of coarse grids, here we simply eliminate those sort of overlap regions. And I'll just show one example quickly of where we made this work. So I've been interested recently in looking at flow, sort of geophysical flows on, on sphere. Okay? So atmospheric flow is an obvious example. And we have this new sort of grid, uh, a sphere grid. There's been recently a lot of interest in, in developing, getting away from grids that are spheric, spherical coordinates because of the obvious pole problem and other issues. And so a grid that we've proposed is this kind of a two-patch grid that where this, this sort of the upper hemisphere is now a multi-block grid. The upper hemisphere is, is uh, sort of this, this square here is mapped to the upper hemisphere, and this lower square is mapped to the lower hemisphere. And you can kind of see, I, I have a few other slides if you're in, I have a few other pictures for people who might be interested. The equator is right along here. And in this particular case, I, want, I set up an example that didn't necessarily align with the equator. Okay, so, so this point right here maps to this point here, and the corner of this patch maps to here. All right, so, so somehow these, these grids are community. They all, they touch at corners and, and at, at edges. Okay. So here's a, a, a kind of a simple, it's not, not, not the, um, you know, a sort of a simple, a simple test to show that the AMR is actually working, but what you can see is that the, um, is that the, uh, we're following this kind of interface, what well, was a sharp interface between this kind of red and blue region. The finest level grids, I haven't shown the grid lines here because you wouldn't see anything otherwise. So this is kind of three levels, coarser grids, next finer grids, and finest level grids. And so, so you can see that the adaptivity is, is, appears to be doing the right thing, okay? I have a few other examples of, of um, things like spiral waves. So we're, we're calling this forest claw. Um, it uses pea forest to manage this parallel multi-block of quad or oak trees. Um, pea forest is, a, is guiding all the parallel transfers. We're, we, we haven't yet done any kind of tests in parallel, but, but we hope to get to that. Uh, we have support for multi-block, which is inherited from pea forest. And this is a big deal, especially a lot of people are interested in these uh, cube sphere grids. And that's a multi-block grid. Um, and it also it allows you to do these sort of more exotic things like that Antarctic grid that I showed you. Uh, flat data structures, so some of the sort of nicer, um, we've included wave propagation algorithms from Clawpack, but one of my goals is to, is to sort of explore a, a, a kind of a, a richer set of, of time dependent of, of time solvers, okay? So multi-rate method of line solvers, and that's gonna require some more creativity than just a single step, uh, and then we we want it, we want to see that it scales. Okay, and I guess finally, this is the sort of application that I have in mind is is looking at this ash cloud modeling example, um, where where uh, you know it's an obvious case in which you you simply you only want to refine in in this region here, and yet because you don't uh, you don't know ahead of time where the ash cloud is going to go you have to include a much larger domain um, to, to sort of allow your solution to, to, to do what it wants to do. So that's, that's what I have. <laughs>